queer people aren't, like we're not a monolith, right? So you can be queer and black and, you know, disabled and like have so many different identities. And the whole point of having diversity in STEAM is because we're using these products and services as a, as a whole, as a society. Hi, my name is Alma, full name Alma Maria Renaz. My pronouns are she, hers. I am a passionate person for cybersecurity awareness and education. I'm also a co-founder of Latinas in Cyber. How would you explain your profession to somebody who had never heard of it before? So people who are not familiar with cybersecurity, I would explain to them that anything that connects to the internet, I make sure that people cannot do bad things with it. And I help people understand that they can be targets for malicious behavior or bad behavior through using technology. And so I help to train them and educate them about that. So I identify as Latina, I also identify as Latinx. I also identify as, a, as Mexican. My mother is originally from Mexico. She currently lives in Mexico now. But I also identify as a third culture kid. So both my parents were immigrants. My father immigrated from Ukraine and my mother immigrated from Mexico and I grew up in New York. And on top of that, I also immigrated because I immigrated to Mexico. I lived in Mexico for almost 20 years and I also became a citizen. So now I have dual citizenship. So I have a bunch of identities like that. The community that I grew up in was very much, I would say is very white. There wasn't a lot of other Latino kids. There wasn't, I think in the, the Catholic school that we went to, there were maybe, I want to say two black kids in the whole school and maybe one Puerto Rican kid and then me and my brother. So it was all very confusing because we didn't really have open conversations around identity. We didn't have open conversations around race being half Ukrainian, half Mexican, what did that mean? For me, it meant actually moving to Mexico to try and figure out what the heck, who the heck I was and what the heck I was doing. One of the things that we talk a lot about in Latinas and Cyber is that being Latino or Latinx or Hispanic or however you, you choose to identify. It's not one thing, it's not a monolith. And I feel the same way about being a member of the LGBTQI plus community. So within the community, I identify as lesbian. I also identify as queer. Oh, and I'm also a parent. So there's another identity that intersects with all the other identities that I have. My mother is a very conservative Catholic. And so that really colored how I grew up and that really also impacted me as a queer person not really understanding what was happening myself. You know, I was a teen in the late 90s, so I feel like people were just beginning to have more open conversations about different sexual expressions or, or I remember the term sexual orientation and as a young person I would I naturally gravitated towards like the gay scene gay clubs I remember going to my first drag show when I was like 17 or 18 and I felt very welcome and like I fit in but I couldn't understand why it was a real contrast because that's what I was doing not the adults in my life didn't know I was doing that. On the, on the other side, I was going to an all girls Catholic school. It was very much this wholesome picture that was being painted of like the, the good Mexican Catholic girl. When I was, again, a young person, maybe 18, 19, 20, when I was in college, having the understanding that, oh, they're there are queer people and back then I don't even think we called it queer because it was seen as a negative term so they're gay people they're homosexuals that's that's the term that I would hear a lot and I heard a lot of negative things from my 
my family of origin, particularly my mom, about homosexuality. I knew that I had an attraction towards people who were women, that looked like women or presented as women. I knew I felt that. But I also realized that it wasn't always exactly that. There was something a little bit more to it, and that's why I identify as queer as well, because for me it comes down to the person and something about the person that I find the attraction to. So being kind of pigeonholed into straight, cisgender, into that, that box never sat right for me, but I didn't have the language to express it. And I actually was married to the father of my children for almost 10 years. And as the relationship progressed, as I grew and mature, because I got, I, I was married pretty young. I was like 23 or 24 when I got married. Homosexuality became more of a conversation, but on a bigger scale. And also I had close friends from high school, a very dear friend of mine from Catholic camp. Uh, she married her college girlfriend and they had kids together. And I, in my parallel, was trying to reconcile what I believed was expected of me to do and be as a good daughter and as good Mexican Catholic and who I really was. I wasn't what they expected me to be, and I had a lot of guilt and shame around that. The, the trauma and the guilt and the shame that is put onto people because of who they are through religion is just really unfortunate because I don't think that when we come down to like what's at the, the heart of many religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs, at least in my understanding, is love. So telling people that they're bad or wrong or going to burn for eternity because of who they are seems, at least for me, totally contradictory to what love is. It was a long process. I don't have like one pivot, like one moment where I was like, oh, it's this. It was like I had been programmed for so many years to think that I had to be a certain way that it took many years of me digging into that programming to understand that actually, no, I'm something else. I did realize that if I didn't change my life, and I wasn't quite sure what I needed to change, I just knew I had to change, that if I didn't change my life, I was gonna die. And for me, that meant a lot of things. That meant getting a divorce, it meant being honest to myself about who I was, and it also meant being honest outwardly. It wasn't easy for me to come out to my, to my kids, it was probably the easiest thing to do. My kids are just like, we don't care, we love you and we want you to be happy. That was not the case with the rest of my family, not the case with my mother, not the case with my ex-husband, not the case with even professionally, it wasn't the case. So my father was probably like my first like engineering role model and I never thought I would be an engineer because I heard a lot of negativity around girls in math and engineering growing up. Not from my dad, but from outside influences. My father's always really supportive of my interest in math and science. My mom went back to school when I was like 14 years old to become a teacher and she taught for a couple of years, but what she really did was technical translations. My father worked many years for Xerox and she actually ended up working for Xerox as well as a technical translator. Wow. So you have both parents kind of in the technical world kind of with that experience growing yeah. up. I love to learn. That for me, the origin of my interest in STEAM comes from there. So along my journey, those aspects of STEAM were being put in my path, but because of some confusing messaging around girls and not being good at math and engineering is for boys and why don't you look at something a little bit more in the humanities and in the, the hard sciences, I would gravitate towards things where, for example, my undergraduate degree is in international relations, which actually ended up being a really great thing for me 
because there's a big aspect of international relations in cybersecurity. My entrance into STEAM really paralleled my own self-acceptance in my identity as a queer person because I had to accept the fact that STEAM was for me and that I could be in STEAM. And I also had to accept the fact that I was queer and that was okay. I taught English as a second language when I lived in Mexico. And through that teaching, I realized that I wanted to learn more about how we were using technology to teach. So when I was pregnant with my last child, I was teaching online and we were using a virtual learning environment. And I just became so curious, how do we do this? Like, how does this technology even exist? Where is this coming from? And that's when I took my first computer science class as an adult. I got involved with a program called Technovation Challenge. And I got involved with that program because I just, and I just happened to know somebody who was a software developer. And I told her that I was learning how to code and she w her response to me was, but why? What she and I did together was we started implementing this program, Technovation Challenge, that is focused at closing the gender gap in tech. At the time, it was designed for girls ages 10 to 18 to learn how to code, but in particular, how to design a mobile app. And so I was exposed to like computer programming through education. And I actually ended up doing my graduate degree in Mexico. My graduate research was based on teaching kids how to speak English using computer science, which was so exciting because you have something like a really graphic, visual piece of technology, which is the block coding and kids can become exposed to a foreign language through that learning. So it's like, almost like killing two birds with one stone. And I was able to do that teaching and education program, that graduate program, while teaching at an international school in Mexico City. So I was able to do those two things at the same time. And that was what really solidified for me that what I really wanted to do was work in tech and that's when I decided to quit my job in teaching and just take a complete face first belly flop into a coding boot camp. And I did it online. And this is where my friend Hilda, the, the QA engineer, really came in because she helped mentor me through the whole process because I found it extremely challenging. I had never done anything like that before, as you pointed out, coming from humanities and coming from education, I, I knew the educational resources to learn how to code, and it was very easy for me to Google stuff, but I needed to acquire the knowledge for myself, and that was the difficult part. It was the algorithmic thinking and breaking a big problem down into smaller pieces that I really needed the mentorship and the support, and it was thanks to my friend who she really helped me through that. And she also helped me realize that I did not want to be a computer programmer. I did not want to be a software developer. I, that was not what I wanted to do. I did feel like there was space for me as a queer person in the boot camp, in the bigger sense, like in tech. And I did the boot camp thanks to the Edie Windsor uh, coding scholarship, which is offered through Lesbians Who Tech. So if it hadn't been for Lesbians Who Tech, I don't think I would be doing what I'm doing. Within tech, I still would come across really bro situations. My experience in cyber, there's been moments where I see that. My experience in tech, there's been moments where I see that. But I can always lean back on my community. I can always lean back on organizations like, obviously, Latinas in Cyber, but Women in Cybersecurity, Lesbians Who Tech, Women in Society Cyber Jitsu, these organizations that will help create, or exist to create opportunities for us. The people around me who are supportive of what I was doing, because there were a lot of people who told me, you're crazy, you shouldn't do that, leave the coding to the boys, to their parents. I had someone say to me, leave the coding to the teenage boys who live in their parents' basement. I had a family member tell me that I was a bad mom for trying and pivot my career and go into tech. 
that I should stay home with my kids and, and stick to teaching. That moment that I realized I did not want to be a software developer, I had to look around and see, well, what else is there? Like, is tech just computer programming? And it's not, it's so much more than that. And I actually had someone in my network suggest that I look at cybersecurity. And I started looking at cybersecurity and realized, like I started connecting the dots. Oh, my background in international relations is actually really helpful. And my background in education is also very helpful because there's, there's a huge, human component to cybersecurity. But I also had to keep that open mind of, okay, you started this journey thinking it was gonna be this thing, but it's okay if it changes. It's okay if you modify your plan. It's not the end of the world. Mentorship is, it, for me, it's like networking. It's the thing that people, if they talk about it, maybe the people listening don't quite understand how important it is. I identify with personally as a cyber big sister and it's that idea of having a cyber big sister that I really want to, I want to be that for other Latinas looking to come into cybersecurity. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the process of co-founding Latinas in Cyber and also the work that the organization does and also how your experience through all of this has brought you into that. Yeah, so Latinas in Cyber is really interesting. I was volunteering at a security conference and a friend of mine said to me, you know, we have women's in cybersecurity, we have like vets in cybersecurity, we have all these organizations to help create more diversity in cybersecurity. Where's the Latinas in cybersecurity? One of the things that we have just completed successfully, we had a mentorship academy and the feedback has been overwhelming. Believe it or not, we had more mentors than mentees. And that's when I, when I heard that, I was just like, wow. So we still have more work to do. We have to go out and find more people who wanna come and take this program because we've got the people out there, we've got the mentors out there who wanna support us, who wanna get more Latinas into cyber. And our ultimate goal is to bring more Latinas into cyber. Mentorship for me has been the key to my success, to getting where I am now. So if you can get that one person to believe in you and to continue to support and nurture you in the sense of they champion you when you're not in the room. If you can find that person and then from that person find more of them because you don't, it's okay to have more than one mentor. It, you actually should want to have more than one mentor. And the mentor is key. It's important to keep in mind that a mentor is just like anybody else, they're a human being. And they're, if they're willing to give of their time, their resources, their network, take them for, what, for who they are and what they can do. And always nurture that relationship. No matter where you are in your career, you want to have a mentor. So finding a mentor and somebody who will advocate and champion for you, it doesn't, it's, it's priceless. It's something that I wish for everybody. One of the barriers was just having support from the people around me. I had to be really intentional in finding people who weren't going to tell me, don't waste your time, don't do that. Oh, why do you want to do that? I had to be really intentional in finding people who were, who could say to me, you should, you can, and I will help you however I can. So one of the barriers is just representation. You can't be what you don't see, which is why I got involved in Technovation Challenge. Because in the end, this is a community that we are trying to build within STEAM that is inclusive, that allows for a, a variety of experiences to help build better products and services. But if we didn't have representation, if we didn't have people in the community who are open and comfortable and sharing their experience, it would be that much harder for queer folk and other members of the LGBTQ community to come into STEAM. Bias shows up in technology all the time. And it's been doing that 
for generations. So if we don't have more diversity, people who think different, people who have different lived experiences, we're never going to have better products and services. We need that diversity to have better products and services. I work with someone who is very different than me, straight white man who lives in Illinois, and we are like the polar opposites. And he has shared with me of why for him it was important to have someone like me on the team. Like he wanted me on the team because I have this different lived experience. I would say that that is one thing that I would bring to cybersecurity or cybersecurity role as an LGBTQI plus person because I am and because I've had to do this work on myself of accepting myself, of coming out of the closet, of all those experiences, I see things through a different lens that I'm sure is, you know, there are overlaps with how other folks in the LGBTQI plus community have also experienced it. I am proud of the fact that I worked with kids who are from economically disadvantaged backgrounds and I helped introduce them to tech. I'm proud of the fact that I've been able to pivot into cyber. I'm proud of the fact that I'm being the change that I want to see in the world and I'm being a, a role model that I, that I would have liked to have had when I was younger. And I'm really proud of the fact that I have found my community. Perfect example, I went to a, it was an open source uh, summit. I went to an open source conference and I was with a bunch of developers, interacting with a bunch of developers. And I, I remember feeling like a little bit, like, like I didn't fit in, like I didn't belong. And then a couple weeks later, I went to a cybersecurity conference and I was just like, oh, these are my people. This is, this is it. And I'm sure there were software developers at the cybersecurity conference as well. It's just, it's a different way of looking at things. It's a different way of seeing things because a cybersecurity conference could potentially have everything from a lock picking booth where you learn to pick locks to how to crack passwords to so many other talks. And it's that type of community where I feel the most comfortable because you have, again, so many different types of people from different backgrounds because we have people who work in cyber who deal with keeping software safe to people who work in cyber who are doing physical penetration tests who are trying to break into like banks or the Federal Reserve and they get paid to do that. So you have like this diversity that I just feel like cyber is a perfect place to have, you know, LGBTQI plus folks just fit right in because there is something queer about cybersecurity, in my opinion. <laughs> Find your mentors. And it's okay if you need to like, maybe you thought one would be a good mentor, but they're not. It's okay for you to pick other people, but identify your mentors and really be intentional about developing a relationship with them. For folks who are interested in getting involved in cybersecurity and who might not, you know, are either from a non-traditional background or who are just getting started, I would invite them to take a look at all the organizations that exist to help bring more diversity into cybersecurity and to get involved get involved. Volunteer, Latinas in Cyber, we have uh, volunteer opportunities, go to networking events, go to uh, conferences. Conferences can be pricey, so that's where the organizations are really important. And then my other piece of advice would be, life is a process and it's the same with your career. Change is a part of the process, you learn as you go practice self-empathy, be kind to yourself, be aware of like your inner voice. What is it telling you? What's it saying to you? What's the tone it's using? How are you treating yourself? Because that's also gonna show up on how you treat people. Just be aware of that because in my experience, I've tended to internalize some of the negativity from 
outside of myself from what other people were telling me. And so I had to really work at pulling that negativity out so I could continue to grow and advance. So to younger folks who are looking to get into cybersecurity and just anyone in the LGBTQI plus community who are looking to get into STEAM, I would say that those are the two most important things that I can share with them.